As a result of the Vietnam War, the Pentagon perceived the media as the enemy. What consequences did this bring? From the perspective of the military, the media could no longer be trusted. Therefore, the media's access to the battlefield needed to be restricted. The news coverage needed to be controlled and the emotional power of images needed to be channeled in ways that prevented another Vietnam in the future. What was required from the Pentagon's point of view was to build a sophisticated PR apparatus, to foster a compliant press, and to placate a nervous and reticent population. The way the 1991 television war addressed the citizen sitting on the couch with a bucket of popcorn and, and a remote control was as this kind of politically disconnected entity um, that could witness the war but not be asked to participate in any meaningful way in the war, uh, either um, political participation or as in World War I through sacrifice of money and material. Um, just sit back and watch. Sit back and enjoy the pretty lights, the fireworks, and um, let us put a show on for you. Um, it's that kind of politically disconnected and privatized uh, experience of consumption that really defined the 1991 Gulf War. It took the Pentagon until the 1991 Gulf War to fully develop this new form of citizen spectator exposed to an all-consuming war. So what we've seen in the interim between 1975 and 1991 are the different ways in which the U.S. administration experimented with how it could manage the media at times of war. The first of these experiments came during the 1983 Grenada invasion. Here, the post-Vietnam military attitude towards the media took extreme forms. All media outlets were denied access to the Caribbean island. And the reasons given for this news blackout were that the invasion happened too abruptly to bring the media along and that the Pentagon would not have been able to guarantee the safety of journalists. The result was a complete news blackout, with the media only being granted access to the country once the invasion had ended. Similarly, restrictive policies were imposed on the U.S. mission in Lebanon around the same time. In other words, the military distrust of the media post-Vietnam resulted in extreme measures that excluded the media from reporting on U.S. military operations. Not surprisingly, the media outcry was huge. And I want to show you just two examples of the types of complaints media outlets were leveling at the military. Take Robert Fry from ABC's World News Tonight, who wrote, We are very concerned about the control, to use a polite word, that the administration has decided to exert on the coverage of the invasion. The concept of the freedom of the press in this situation is not adhered to. We have been totally blacked out. Or take another one from Howard Simmons, managing editor of the Washington Post. I think a secret war, like a secret government, is antithetical to an open society. It's absolutely outrageous. These were very serious accusations. The media's lack of access constituted a clear violation of the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. The First Amendment constitutionally enshrines the freedom of information and the freedom of the press. And in both Grenada and Lebanon, these rights were trampled by a military still haunted by the ghosts of Vietnam. As a result, the Pentagon, run by Secretary of Defense Caspar Weinberger at the time, came under huge public and political pressure. The big question that arose was how to strike a balance between the rights enshrined in the First Amendment on the one hand and the legitimate concern for national security on the other. To review media-military relations during wartime, a commission was set up, the so-called Seidel Commission. 
Its recommendations were a compromise. While the Commission recognized that the US government's concerns for national security was legitimate, it also requested that the media's rights under the First Amendment needed to be upheld. For military planners having to devise a new media system, this presented a challenge. On the one hand, the model they used in Grenada and Lebanon was unacceptable as the media had been blocked out. On the other hand, the model used in Vietnam was unacceptable to the military because it was seen as giving too much freedom to the media. The media needed to be included, whether military planners liked it or not. And so the idea became to tune television's potential as a centralized gatekeeper, to use media as a controlled channel between the home front and the battlefront, while satisfying public demand for war news. Here, the Pentagon copied the model Britain had used during the 1982 Falklands War. Interestingly, Britain designed its Falkland media strategy in response to the US war in Vietnam. Now, the US modeled its media strategy in Panama on Britain's Falkland strategy. But how exactly did this work in Panama in 1989? Prior to the invasion in Panama in 1989, the Pentagon called in the US press corps and laid out the new system. It first announced that it would give two television teams, three newspaper journalists and two radio presenters access to the battlefield in Panama. It then announced that this pool of selected journalists had to sign up to the conditions set by the Pentagon. Conditions which stated that journalists would have no free movement on the battlefield. Instead, they would, at all times, have to be escorted by US soldiers. Another condition stated that the military would retain a veto over what could be published. That the military would retain the right to review and to edit any information before it could be published. For the media, it effectively meant signing up to a system of censorship. The media representatives were outraged at the Pentagon's proposals. But surprisingly, they were not outraged over the censorship clauses or the restricted battlefield access. Instead, they complained about the limited numbers that were supposed to cover the war. What? Two camera teams? three newspaper journalists and two radio stations? Are you kidding me? We all want to go. So an intense period of lobbying for more numbers on the ground began. And after a few days, the Pentagon finally granted permission for most media outlets to come along. From the perspective of the Pentagon and the White House, this was a brilliant strategic move. What they succeeded in doing was to shift the entire controversy over freedom of information and over the First Amendment onto questions over access to the battlefield. And so journalists and media outlets quietly signed the conditions set by the military. This new system allowed for a media presence, something that not only pleased the media, but that also upheld the First Amendment to the US Constitution. And it gave the military a way to connect the battlefront with the home front, in a way that could be controlled politically. It ensured that the restricted pool of officially selected reporters stood close to military advisors, but far from the action. And the censorship clauses signed by the press pool ensured that the war reporting would be in line with how the Pentagon wanted its wars to be perceived. That's how the Pentagon put in place a system of media control that effectively allowed it to regain the ability to control the representation of US wars among the American public and a wider Western audience.
The pool system showed that the US administration still viewed the press as something that needed to be negatively suppressed rather than positively channeled. But it equally taught the Pentagon that the solution to the Vietnam syndrome could be found neither in total press freedom nor in total press exclusion, but rather in large-scale press integration into a system of Pentagon public relations. The Pentagon therefore institutionalized the press pooling model on the grand scale during the 1991 Gulf War and has continued using it as a refined model in what we now have come to know as embedded journalism. The question that of course arises is why the press accepted this system? Why did the press allow itself to be aligned as an extension of military public relations strategy? The answer is quite simple. It was made possible through changes in the economic landscape already in motion in the 1980s. In particular, neoliberal policies of deregulation, driven through Reaganomics and Thatcherism, had a number of significant effects on the media sector itself. The first effect of neoliberal policies of privatization and deregulation was that it triggered oligopolization a process for which an ever larger share of the media sector is owned by an ever smaller number of corporations. For example, in the United States, oligopolization meant that what used to be over 100 independently owned television channels in 1983 turned into a market where only 20 years later all TV stations in the US were owned by a mere five corporations. One observable effect of oligopolization has been that it has led to a dwindling of competing perspectives. The second general effect of neoliberal policies has been the rise of news corporations that are based more on business prerogatives than ideals of journalistic practice. As a result, there has been a tendency to jettison expensive forms of journalism, such as investigative reporting and the coverage of international news, to give it up in favor of opinion, entertainment and infotainment. Furthermore, the business-minded news corporations tend to see prefabricated official public relations material as cheap news that often gets passed off as journalism. Economically, it's very attractive for a news organization. No hotel rooms, no per diems. Uh, you don't have to worry about laundry costs. Uh, feed costs, yeah, they'll probably still have to pay for those. I mean, the underlying subtext to almost every media development we've seen over the last 15 or 20 years, certainly in the digital age, has always been economical. So it's not just political. Yeah, we get what the, we get the, we get what the Pentagon gets out of this. And these people at CNN or other American broadcasting outlets, or even the BBC dealing with the British military, they're fully aware of the compromises that come with this. But they either find the offering and the, and, and the connection to the story irresistible or they find the economics irresistible. It's a very, very important part. War zone, is, war zone reporting is an expensive proposition. I mean, insurance alone keeps certain news organizations out of war zones. And this is just another layer to the embed story that a lot of people don't think about. It saves them a lot of money. Accustomed to a diet of drip-fed PR material due to merge and purge economics, American corporate media was well prepared to pair up with the Pentagon for Panama and also for the 1991 Gulf War.